Welcome everyone to a pre-lecture for the MR Imaging course BME 7710 for graduate students at Wayne State University. Today I'm just going to give you a very short introduction to why I think magnetic resonance is particularly exciting. In fact, uh, back in 2004 when I was lucky enough to be awarded the gold medal from the ISMRM, for the work that we did in susceptibility weighted imaging and educational issues, one of the comments that I made to the audience at that time is that MR is semper incitari, never a dull moment in MR. There are always exciting things happening, and I hope that by the time you're done this course, you'll feel the same way as well. And uh, one of the main points of this course is to give you the foundation you need so that you're going to be able to pick up a journal article in MR almost anywhere and be able to understand what you're reading. So there is a great deal of excitement for research in the field of MRI. The image that's up here right now is actually an oxygen extraction fraction map that shows the vessels in green, and the vessels in this case are veins, and the susceptibility in the veins allows me to figure out how much deoxyhemoglobin is present in those veins. The light blue that you see represents the iron content in the basal ganglia and the midbrain so that one can actually now quantitatively make these measurements with resolutions as small of about one-tenth of a cubic millimeter. So some of the things I want to bear in mind as we're teaching this course and, and be thinking about from my perspective over the next few years is the uh, ability to look at future educational and research imaging concepts so that we can establish a dual title or, or specialty degree imaging program perhaps at Auburn University. We already have established that at Wayne State University. To consider distance learning lectures in MRI that will start here from Wayne State University but in the future we may give them from anywhere a weekly Skype or QQ meeting to discuss MRI problems for students, a journal club for future discussions on the internet, a forum for students to interact with faculty in MR research also through the internet, a repository for indirect study projects for imaging and MRI basically to be produced by faculty members for students so that they can grab onto particular projects. That might be something like doing high-resolution MR angiographic imaging, or it might be new methods for imaging sodium, for example. Um, we'd also like to create a repository for potential papers and grant ideas. Here at BME, we believe that all students should learn how to not just write papers, but also learn how to put their ideas together in such a coherent fashion that they can write grants in the future. And if you're going to become an academic person, you need to be able to write grants. Uh, we also want to establish software for viewing and quantitative processing of MR data. We have some software like that called SPIN, and we will be putting a free version of SPIN um, onto the website. And then possibly in the future, maybe job postings for MRI that might help some of you who are finishing off or finishing your, your postdocs. And we're going to be using this book, Magnetic Resonance Imaging, Physical Principles and Sequence Design. The second edition is available this summer. And we're going to see things like this um, throughout the course. And that is examples of different types of imaging and imaging contrasts and imaging mechanisms. So in this particular slide, we have uh, four types of contrast. We have a T1 weighted image in the upper left. And you can see the white matter, gray matter contrast quite beautifully with the CSF looking dark. On the upper right, you see a T1 with contrast agent. And now all the blood vessels are bright because we use a T1 reducing contrast agent in this case. In the lower left, you can see a T2 image. And now everything is inverted from the T1. The gray matter is now darker. Oh, sorry, the gray matter is now brighter. The white matter is now darker. And the CSF is very bright. And of course, T2 was used in the early days a lot and is still used for trying to find abnormalities uh, such as the presence of inflammation, the presence of tumors. Uh, it's a very powerful method. And flare in the bottom right is also used as a very sensitive technique for look, looking at white matter abnormalities. So the beauty of MR is that it's a powerful, flexible, 
non-invasive, non-ionizing means by which to image the soft tissues in the human body. And that makes it not, not only a powerful tool for the radiologist, but also for us as scientists. And if you were to ask me, would I rather get a CT scan or a PET scan or a SPECT scan, my answer would be, no thanks, I'd much rather have an MRI scan. Now, these images you've been looking at, it's kind of interesting. I, I try to tell the radiologist that when they look at a, a T1-weighted image, or any MR image for that matter, that they are actually visualizing quantum mechanics. This is not some ethereal idea invented a hundred years ago by people like Bohr and Schrodinger and these people. This is truly a representation of the quantum mechanics that's taking place in the human body and in anything else that we image like this with MR. And the physicists like Bloch and Purcell and many others who did this early work on NMR, they were able to take their physics understanding and create a tool such as magnetic resonance and now magnetic resonance imaging so that we could actually visualize the human body. So that is a quantum mechanics picture you are looking at. Now, some of the other applications that we uh, could talk about a little bit and will later in the course in more detail is magnetic resonance angiography. It's something near and dear to my heart. I've been working in problems related to imaging the vascular system, uh, both in terms of the anatomy, the blood flow, the vessel wall, uh, for probably 25, 30 years now, and I think it's certainly been worth every year's effort that we've put into this because many neurological diseases and cardiovascular diseases are related to problems with the vascular system. Um, here's an example of what you can actually image in the brain today, and you can see very nicely the major arteries. Uh, this is using a special technique called time of flight. And these are very pretty pictures, but what I would uh, pose it to you is they're, what we're only really seeing the major vessels. We're really not seeing the small vessels that actually feed the tissue, that take the oxygen to the tissue. So although we can see stenosis of these major vessels, we don't see the microvascular disease. So the recent challenge I've given students is We've got to go one level deeper. We've got to image not at the level of one millimeter, but at 250 microns, 100 microns, maybe 50 microns in the future. So here's an example of a, a scan that was done with uh, Professor Yang Chuan Ye in our group. And uh, the image, the larger image, actually comes from a very famous work of George Salomon. It's uh, a cadaver brain that was injected with a dye, and then a picture was taken of it. And the inset that is shown here, blown up to look roughly the same as the thalamic arteries of the cadaver brain, represents 250 microns by 250 microns in plane and 500 micron slice thickness. And you can see many of these tiny vessels we see in the cadaver brain can now be seen in the human brain. And this can be done in about 10 minutes on a 3T scanner. And this is not really used yet clinically by people. Do we use it on a research venue? Yes, we do. Should we get that out into the real world? Yes, we should. And in fact, that's another challenge for you as students and researchers in the future. How do you take the developments that you've done and turn them into something practical? This is an example of looking at the vessels in the neck. And these are some MS patients that turn out to have stenosis of the jugular veins. Um, and maybe this is representative of problems that these people have. Maybe it's involved with reduced perfusion to the brain for these patients. We don't know the answer to that question yet. Uh, here's an example of uh, quantitative flow imaging, where we take a cross-section through some of those vessels in the neck, and now we look at what the flow as a function of the cardiac cycle is. So in this particular case, if you look at the upper red lines, they represent the left and right common carotid artery and the blood flow through those. Those are the bright white objects in the image on the right-hand side. The jugular veins are shown as dark, and they're shown by the dark blue and light blue lines in both the upper and lower graphs. The upper graph is the flow as a function of the cardiac cycle, and the lower graph is the integrated flow as a function of the cardiac cycle. Now, some other techniques that we've been looking at are something called susceptibility-weighted imaging and quantitative susceptibility mapping. 
Uh, this is another book that was published on this topic just a few years ago. And what we can do now is to look at the veins instead of the arteries. And for a hundred years, we've spent most of our clinical efforts studying stenosis and poor blood flow to the tissue. But in fact, the venous signal tells you how the tissue actually functions. So if you have the tissue eating up a lot of oxygen, that means that these veins will contain a lot of deoxyhemoglobin. And if you reduce perfusion to the tissue, then that tissue will eat up even more oxygen. So potentially, the darker the veins get, the more abnormal the blood flow to the brain could be considered. So these are really quite beautiful images showing you all the veins in the brain at 7 Tesla. And here's an example now at um, 1.5 Tesla that shows for a stroke patient who has reduced perfusion as demonstrated in the MTT map in the upper right, you can now see on the SWI images that the veins went very dark in that same area. They went very dark because they have very high levels of deoxyhemoglobin. You then treat the patient, and lo and behold, if you look at the bottom two images, that mean transit time delay is gone, the perfusion has improved, and the tissue is functioning normally. You can send the patient home so everybody's happy. Now, we can also use this SWI approach to create quantitative susceptibility maps looking at iron. And here, in these images, we can see the iron in the basal ganglia in the upper three levels, the brightest being the globus pallidus. And in the lower regions, we can see in the bottom left two images, the red nucleus and the substantia nigra, which are then actually highlighted here. We can now quantify those. Well, it turns out that this is actually important because in some diseases, you get very high iron content. And you need to basically then map out what iron looks like as a function of age. And you can do that with this technology without having to cut the brain open, without having to sacrifice the volunteer. Now, of course, we should really keep our eye on where we're going here. And this is uh, an image from Yang Chuan Ye showing that we really can image with very high resolution. This is 128 microns in one direction, in this case, the up-down direction, in an attempt to image the retina. Now, although we have a long way to go here to improving signal to noise, it demonstrates that even with today's equipment, we can do much better than what is used in the standard clinical environment. We can also study things like um, white matter fiber tracks. This is done with diffusion tensor imaging. And here you can see some beautiful color images showing you all the connections between the different parts of the brain. And all of these things I'm showing you here, you're going to be able to understand how they work, how to get them, and how to read papers on these by the end of the course. And now I'm going to show you um, an example of some fetal images. And I'm going to show you something that came after this paper when they started looking at rapid methods of collecting the data. And in that case, we have this image that shows the actual great vessels and heart of the fetus. We were actually looking at imaging the vessels of the mother and the placenta. And to our surprise, in the end, we were actually able to, to image the cardiovascular system of the fetus itself. So there are many, many things that can be done in MR. This is by far just a very short introduction. I will give you a longer introduction on the first formal lecture. So um, I think that's the end of this little test round, and we look forward to your participation in the course. Thank you very much.